Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now, I just put brand new batteries in, but sometimes when it gets real loud like this, it dies. So we'll see. There's four more in the charger. Um, welcome to our worship service today. Uh, we're continuing the celebration of our Savior Jesus in the season of Epiphany. Um, as you are here in church, we hope that you like it. If you are watching at home on Facebook, uh, please, please give us a like. Uh, we appreciate that a lot. And then we can kind of see if we're getting our message through and how effectively we're doing that. So the uh, millions of you out there, <laughs> keep watching. <laughs> Join the big crowd here. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 91. Hymn number 91. This morning, the order of service that we're following is in the front of the hymnal, the service of word and sacrament, and it's on page 26. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you promised him your beloved son, you proclaimed him your beloved son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Testament lesson for Epiphany 1 is recorded in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to the prophet Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I see a king for myself among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will let you know what you are to do. 
You are to anoint for me the person that I will point out to you. So Samuel did what the Lord had told him to do and went to Bethlehem. Trembling with fear, the elders of the city came to meet him. They said, do you come in peace? He said, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they had come, he looked at Eliab and said, certainly this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at how tall he is because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not look at things the way man does. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Is that all of the young men? Jesse said, They are still the youngest, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send for him, because we cannot sit down to eat until he comes. He sent for him and brought him in. David had red hair and striking eyes and was good looking. The Lord said, get up, anoint him, because this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. The spirit of the Lord rushed on David with power from that day forward. After that, Samuel set out and returned to Ramah. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson is recorded in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward mankind appeared, he saved us, not by righteous works that we did ourselves, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs in keeping with the hope of eternal life. This is our epistle lesson. The verse of the day. Alleluia. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Alleluia. Gospel is recorded in Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, and then verses 21 and 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John could be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but someone mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. While he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. I am well pleased with you. 
Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated for our next hymn. You will need to use your hymnals for this hymn. Hymn number 89. When I was getting everything ready, I looked at hymn 88 and 89 and gave both those numbers to Shirley because I looked at the titles. To Jordan came the Christ our Lord. To Jordan's River came our Lord. And I got confused that they were the same hymn, different tunes. tunes. We know this one. The words are in the hymnal. And we'll do verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6. to consider is recorded in Luke chapter 2 after the Christmas story but before his baptism the boy Jesus at the temple every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover when he was 12 years old they went up to the feast according to the custom after the feast was over while his parents were returning home the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, 
and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. These are God's words for our meditation this morning. Well, dear Christian friends, today I'm going to be talking about routines. And first, I want to get some idea of some of the routines that you have. Anyone make some New Year's resolutions that you've already broken? <laughs> uh, be honest. Yeah. Or you didn't bother because you knew you would. Yeah. When we make resolutions, our life has to make some changes. We've got to find a way to get into a new, better routine to push ourselves away from the table, to stay away from the dessert tray, to make sure that we exercise each and every day. You've got to get into a routine to do that because your body and your mind are going to tell you, oh, can't do it. I'm going to quit next year, maybe. When the pandemic started, and I know that's been a while now, one of the... <laughs> Routines that was disturbed for all of us was going to church on Sunday morning. And we had to do that, I believe it was until May. No church from March to May. And those were very difficult times because we missed Easter, we missed some of the Lenten services, we missed Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Um, our council members and I could gather together in a group of six and record an abbreviated worship service and try to put that out for our members to be able to at least see something. But I remember that, probably that first month of not going to church, of waking up at my regular time, getting all ready and then realizing I don't have anywhere to go and I don't have anyone to see. And it was kind of just heartbreaking to sit at the table, look across the church and realize we're not in church yet. We recorded our services on Thursday evening so that they could be uh, broadcast at least by Sunday, but I mean, that was very, very challenging. As the pandemic came closer and closer to its end, and we pray that it will totally be done to the point where we don't have to really worry about it anymore, people still were not all back into the routine of coming to church. They weren't back into the routine of going to their office to do any work either. Their lives had changed. And for some who are watching us today, Keep on watching. Thank you very much. If you can get here, we would appreciate it. We'd love to have you. We miss you. You're in a routine, a different routine. And our members and visitors who are here today are in their regular routine. You walk in the doors. You know who's going to greet you. You know who's going to hug you up at the top of the stairs. And you know where you're going to sit. And don't let anyone else take that spot. <laughs> and cheerfully share it with them. Routines. They can have very good aspects to them, but they are letting you know, here's what's on the schedule. My phone beeps Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and says, you've got one hour till church. Good. That's my routine. Finish up here with everything getting ready, go back home, and come back. Routines. Jesus and his parents had a routine. We, we hear about one specific one, going to the temple in Jerusalem once a year. They traveled from, Bethlehem, from Nazareth to Jerusalem, and they would offer their sacrifices, they would offer their prayers, they would gather together with their fellow believers as the Lord had wanted them to do, and then they'd go back home. Sometimes that could take three to five days before they left because there was just so much to take care of while they were in Jerusalem. When his family gets back home, 
Does it mean they don't worship for the rest of the year? No, their routine would have been, let's go to the synagogue, let's go to our local place of worship, let's listen to the Old Testament scriptures that are read from the scrolls and hear a message on those Old Testament scriptures. They may have even sung psalms at that service while they were there, but they definitely sang psalms on their way to and from Jerusalem. And that's what many of the ones in Psalms in the 120s are all about, singing psalms on the way to Jerusalem and the way home, having God watching over them. So routines can be you know, very, very good. There's an advantage of if you are in the right routine, and what you are doing is not destructive to yourself, to anyone else, but builds us up in physical life and especially in spiritual life. Those are good routines. There's still a danger to them. Um, this summer at the anniversary service that thankfully I appreciate so much, my son started out the service with the liturgy from the old blue hymnal, starting at page five. And I heard probably just as many comments about that as I heard about other parts of the service, like the music and the message. He had the old hymnal. And we really didn't need to look at the words that were up there. For a lot of people, they were still right in our heart. And they came out so quickly. Now, our younger generation from 91 on, you and I have been working with, not that I'm the younger generation, but we've been working with the red one. And it's starting to become more and more familiar with us. And now, just in the last, um, after the pandemic, I think it was that we started using the service of Word and Sacrament, the one that we're using today. We're using morning praise a lot more often, service of the word, and once a month, page 15, common service. It helps us keep variety with still a, an object of here are the parts that are going to be in every service. And so they will be there, but there'll be other things that will go with it to spice up our lives. But after, let's say, the Red Hymnal started here around 2000, I think, uh, after Pastor Riediger came, and um, he was able to convince you to start to use that. Someday a new pastor will come. It's gonna be a while, but that pastor will probably try to encourage you to use the brand new Christian worship, the new blue worship. Um, right now, we're not in a hurry. It's there. We'll take out bits and pieces from it, and we'll use that in variety. We've used a lot of hymns from the supplement. We'll start looking at some of the hymns from the newest hymnal as well. So routines. Routines are good unless we go through the motions and not really pay attention to what we're doing. Uh, I would imagine everyone in your life, you've had times where you have all sat down to eat, said your prayers, talked and visited for a little bit, and then someone said, did, did we forget to pray? Um, I, I can't remember. We just say it, and we're done. Or the Lord's Prayer, that we can say that very quickly as well, and then we're done. And not get any substance out of those words and focus on each one of those seven petitions of all the promises that God has for us in his word from our heavenly father talk to us by Jesus. So when routines get dull and boring, you know, people sometimes want something different. And in this world, there's always something different somewhere with someone and we pray that you appreciate our worship services, but I think that when we have the outdoor service and the special services, I think everybody kind of perks up a little bit that this is, this is different. 
We're still going to hear God's word. We're still going to have prayers. We're still going to sing. There'll still be a message. But it's different in some ways. And that helps keep our variety and interest. Now, we're not going to have an outdoor service in the winter. That would be crazy. But while we gather together inside, we now have valet parking. <laughs> For our, our visitors at home, think about that. We have valet parking because our parking lot has ice on it, and we want to make sure that people can get from their car to the church. And sometimes they will just drive up to the doors, let their passengers out, get out, and someone will go park their car. And then bring it back after the service. So think about that. How many churches in the wells do you think have valet parking? Spread the news. <laughs> so this routine worship is very good for us. But there are times when a non-routine is very important as well. Getting out of the routine and doing something totally different but related. Jesus and his parents would regularly worship. That was God's command to them in the Old Testament scriptures. It, God made it into a commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And for the Old Testament Jews, Friday evening when sundown comes, the Sabbath day begins and it ends on Saturday evening when the sun goes down again. In the New Testament, we have the freedom to worship on any day that we would choose to do so because Jesus has fulfilled that Old Testament command but he also reminds us that the full meaning of that command is don't just focus on a day. Make sure you worship. Make sure you worship. If you're one of those people that say, I, I go out and worship in nature and I get everything that I need out of that, well, sometime take me along. I want to see how you worship. I want to see what's going on. I want to see what you have to get anything out of. Because the trees don't talk, the animals don't talk, and unless we've got something from God's word out there with us, we may not be getting anything at all. What happened on this day in Jesus' life is that he and his family went to Jerusalem. They were together, and then you, you know how kids are a big gathering, they're gone. They're with their friends, they're having fun, they're here, there, and the other place. Uh, when I was young, we had the freedom to run around our little small town in North Dakota. And we knew that when the six o'clock whistle blew, because we had a noon and a six, head home as quick as you can, because that was our alarm clock. You no longer can wander all over town. And when, when I think about how far we wandered and the places that we went, I, I'm wondering why my parents didn't panic more than they did because they were calm about it. Quiet little town. Well, there aren't any quiet little towns anymore in America. We, we pray that there would be, that there seems to be danger in every part of this world, and we've got to watch out. Well, Jesus did not go run around with the other kids. He had a destination in mind. His parents went to the temple to make their sacrifices, and he went to the temple to be in one of the outer courts where the teachers and the elders of the law and the priests were at, and they would be discussing various points of Scripture. They will be reading different parts of Scripture. They will be talking about this rabbi said this about this one, and this rabbi said this, and we'll come to a consensus here, and we'll talk a little bit more. Well, Jesus was there, and after his patient listening, he um, answered questions intelligently with wisdom that was beyond a 12-year-old. And these men that were there with him began to realize 
here's, here's someone that's a child prodigy. He's got wisdom that the children at that age don't have, and he's got wisdom that a lot of the men in our gathering do not have either, and he actually had a lot more than that. And then he'd ask them questions, and they would have to search the scriptures to find their answers. If they could not find them, he was there to share. Oh yeah, take out this scroll and look here. Now that's a challenge for uh, Old Testament believers uh, because it's take out the scroll and go look for chapter three in Luke two. Well, that's a New Testament book. Chapter 53 in Isaiah, go find that. There's no chapters, there's no numbers. You just kind of have to know it's, it's like uh, three-fourths of the way in to that scroll of Isaiah. And that's where you're going to find it. You've got to search through it and read and figure out where it is. Jesus had that knowledge. His parents had certainly brought him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They shared with him God's word as well because they wanted him to serve and they wanted him to be prepared to take his place in the Jewish society. So this is a non-routine result. Jesus is the one who is teaching. Jesus is the one who is explaining. And Jesus is there with these people. And the word begins to go out, the events of his birth, 12 years, some of that might have been forgotten, the events that take place while he's 12 years old in the temple, that is going to be something that's going to be the talk of the town and because so many people were there from all over the country, it would go throughout the country. And then when his parents finally realized on their way home after a day that he actually was not with them and they did a fine search to check that out, they realized they've got to do what you and I have to do. When we lose our wallet, lose our keys, lose our glasses, you know, whatever it is that we put somewhere, we've got to retrace our steps. We've got to think hard, retrace our steps, and figure out where that place was. That's what Mary and Joseph did. They lost their son. When did we last see him? When did anyone last see him? Oh yeah, at the temple. At the temple. And that's where they went. And they saw Jesus. And they saw what he was doing and they were uh, surprised and kind of peeved at him that he put them through that search and that anxiety that was going on in their minds. And yet, you know, he very simply spoke to them in a very polite way. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Twelve years have gone by since his birth, since the Magi, since the flight into Egypt. When will the child begin to show the promises that he is supposed to fulfill? Well, they're starting. And they will continue again at age 30. And as this entire group goes back to Nazareth and goes to all the other places in the country, this is going to be talked about more and more. 18 years later, he'll start that ministry. When we do routine things the same way every time, but don't pay attention, we don't get good results. But when we pay attention and look very carefully, we'll see that in God's word today in our worship, in the sacrament today in our worship, we have Jesus with us as we always do. And because he's with us, that always makes our worship a special occasion and a special event. Uh, I'm trying to think of the definition for you know, doing things the same way time after time and getting the same results and doing it over and over and over again. At some point, you have to break the pattern and you have to do something different to get a different result. And with God's word, we're going to keep on sharing that by reading it, by talking about it, by singing it, but we're going to continue to look for ways to share it. 
because the Lord wants to bless us in every way that we have. Routine worship. Oh, no, God, go to church again today. I'm sure I said it when I was younger. I wasn't a pastor from birth, you know. Um, and my brother and sisters, too. We want to rejoice that this is a special time and a special opportunity for us because the Lord promises unusual results, unusual blessings. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue now with the confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is on page 31 and up here on the front wall. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, is worshiped in unity with the Father and the Son, is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the altar. <laughs> This morning in our prayers, we have two special prayers. One of them is for Porto Green Thrun. Um, she lives here in the valley. She is in the hospital, uh, extremely life-threatening situation. We want a prayer for her today. Uh, we also want to offer a prayer. Tell me, tell me a name. I'm just frozen up here. Mary, Who? Mary, Mary Jo. Yeah, Mary Jo Modis. I got a new name, got it written down, didn't write the other one down. Mary Jo Modis. She's um, 
experiencing, again, some very severe difficulties, and it's a long time, a uh, couple of months at least, till she can get into the hospital at Mayo to be more actively uh, fighting against it. I'll offer a prayer for her too. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we know that you're the great physician of body and soul. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants in their time of extreme illness. If it is your will, continue to spare their life and to work to restore their strength. You gave your son to bear all of our infirmities and weaknesses. You're the medicine for us when we are sick. You're the strength when we need help. You are life itself when we fear death. We know you are the way when we long for heaven, for you are light when all is dark. We thank you for your spiritual food when we need your nourishment. Another one of our topical prayers for today, for the National Wells National Conference on Lutheran Leadership held in Chicago. Father in heaven, you've given all of us abilities to be used in your service. We thank you for providing gifted leaders to share their knowledge and experience with many others at this week's Wells National Conference of Luth on Lutheran Leadership. Bless those who attend the gathering with strong desire and ideas for sharing the important message of Jesus Christ, the Savior of all. Give the speakers the zeal of the prophets and the wisdom of Solomon to instill in those who attend love for you and others. May the participants receive many blessings that they can share in their con con congregations when they get back home again. We also join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past, he spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. part of the service after the benediction right now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.